ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to Harvard and to today's event, the 2014 Harvard Innovation for Greece Conference. Uh, this event has been organized and hosted by the Harvard College Hellenic Society, which is the organization of students of Greek descent in Harvard College. So my name is Constant Tarabanis. I'm a junior in Harvard College, and along with Stella Pandela, we are the co-presidents of the Harvard College Hellenic Society. So our society decided to inaugurate such an annual event in order to provide a forum on issues that are of importance to Greece. As we all know, there are many such issues today which are of significance not only to Greece, but also in Europe, but even broader. For the past five years now, Greece has been going through a very deep crisis, which is economic but also social. Important steps have been made to address the difficult issues that have been brewing for years. Now, at the start of the crisis, these problems reached a critical point and demanded their resolution. Resolutions, however, that have come with a very high social cost, especially among the more vulnerable groups of society. Now, having grown up in Greece, I experienced the sudden changes that were rapidly taking place because of the crisis. Now, since then, when visiting, I see a country trying to rebalance after the shocks that it has endured and trying to restart for a new era. We hope that events like this will provide the intellectual horsepower that will propel Greece into a new and prosperous era. Now, an ancient Greek philosopher will be the patron of each year's Harvard Innovation for Greece conference. This year's patron is Archimedes, the prototypical innovator and philosopher of ancient Greece, whom you can see on the invitation. Also, this year's conference includes topics from three distinct fields corresponding to our three speeches, namely government, agriculture, and education. Together with Archimedes in spirit, we are very happy and honored today to have with us the distinguished Harvard professor, Professor James Robinson. We are also very happy to have with us two Harvard students, Stefan Yapis and Eugene Vios. Unfortunately, Professor Roberts informed us in, earlier today that he will not be able to attend because he fell yesterday and broke his leg. We send him our warm regards and hope he gets better soon. I would like to inform you that there will be a Q&A session after each talk, and if time allows, one at the end of every talk. Okay, thank you, Constantine, and hello from me too. Um, so with this, I would like to introduce to you our first speaker, Professor James Robinson. So James Robinson is the David Florence Professor of Government at Harvard University and a faculty associate at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science and the Weatherhart Center for International Affairs. He previously taught um, in the Department of Economics at the University of Melbourne the University of Southern California, and before moving to Harvard, was a professor in the departments of economics and political science at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, his main research interests are in comparative economic and political development, with a focus on the long run, with a particular interest in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Professor Robis Robinson has recently co-authored a book that you may have seen or, or even read entitled Why Nations Fail and can thus give us valuable insights into the very deep roots of the problems that countries like Greece have been facing. I would like to note that the book has also been published in Greek. Thank you, um, thank you all and like I give the floor to Professor Robinson. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, um, so, so my plan uh, was to uh, was to talk about my book. Uh, that's what I, that's my plan was to talk about my book. I'm not an expert, I mean, I'm, Europe, I'm English, but I'm not an expert on Greek or even European economic development, uh, as, 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 was, as you heard. Most of my research is in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. So, so, so I'm not gonna, uh, my, the book, Why Nations Fail, is about comparative economic development and it sort of provides a simple framework for thinking about why some countries are rich and why some countries are poor and why some do well economically and others don't. So I guess that's very relevant for thinking about Greece. But I'm not going to pretend to sort of give you some overarching explanation of economic development in Greece. I'm happy to discuss it and ask the questions and make conjectures about it. But I think what I'll try to do is just talk a little bit about the framework and then I'll let you reflect on how this may or may not uh, apply to Greece, if that's okay with you. Okay, so 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 I you know so the book you know the book I write lots of asinine obscure academic articles you know as as befits a, a, a academic 
but the book is supposed to be sort of user friendly and, and, and accessible. So when I talk about this, I usually just, you see, I don't even have PowerPoint slides. You know, every good professor has PowerPoint slides. So, so I'm, 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 not, I'm just going to talk. So, uh, so I just usually motivate the ideas in the book and the sort of the theory in the book with examples. So uh, I never quite know which example works very well. Uh, I had to, recently I gave a talk about this in Bulgaria. The, the Bulgar they launched a Bulgarian edition of our book. So I went to Sofia and gave these lectures in Sofia and I thought, oh gosh, how am I going to motivate this? Because usually I start by talking about the Americas, about the difference between North America and South America. And I think, gosh, will anyone know about South America in Sofia? So I, di I didn't talk about the Americas. But since we're sitting here in Harvard, I thought I could probably get away with motivating it by talking about the Americas, okay? And why is it that, uh, you know, if you look over the last couple of hundred years, this immensely prosperous and successful uh, society emerged in North America, but not, uh, not in Latin America, okay? In fact, you know, the Americas is interesting because if you thought about it historically and you thought about, you know, which countries in the Americas are economically successful and others are not economically successful, it actually would have been very difficult to predict uh, what we see today in the world, you know, in the sense that if you go back 500 years to the time of the conquest of the Americas, actually the parts of the Americas that were doing much better in terms of economic development, in terms of building states and political institutions were in Central America, you know, in the Central, in the Central Valley of Mexico, in Andean and South America, you know, you had the Aztecs and you had the Incas who had all sorts of organization, you know, the Incas built 25,000 miles of road, they had famine relief, they had a kind of postal system, it was only for the king and the, you know, the Inca, it was only for the aristocracy and the elites, but, you know, that's how the British postal service started out in the 17th century too, it was just for the royal family to communicate and the king, you know, so, so the Incas actually had a functional postal service before the, Inca, before the English did, which is sort of interesting. So, you know, what was North America or Canada? You know, those were really backward places lacking technology and the type of organization or you saw in Central America or Mexico or Andean South America. So if you were, you know, you were sort of standing there 500 years ago and you thought, you know, well, how would I expect this to evolve over time? You'd be very surprised that somehow this enormously successful, rich society emerged in North America and, you know, not in South America. So that's a sort of one of the puzzles we use to motivate the book. But, and I'm going to tell you the story about, you know, why the world didn't look like you might have imagined it would have done 500 years ago. You know, you could easily have imagined that all of that would have kind of gone on. And if you rolled the clock forward 500 years, where would prosperity be in South America? Well, it, you know, it would be in Mexico, it would be in Guatemala and Peru, and these places would be doing well, and North America would be backward, and, you know, so, so, but that's not what happened, of course. I'm going to try to tell you a story about what created that enormous sort of reversal in prosperity in some sense. But before I do, since, you know, we're, we're talking about entrepreneurship and things like that, let me say something very important about understanding prosperity and long-run economic growth, which is that, uh, and something very central to the book, which is that since the, 19, the work in the 1950s of Robert Solow, the Nobel Prize winning economist at MIT, economists have known that what drives economic growth is what Solow called it total factor productivity, which sounds very boring and sort of nerdy. But what he meant was uh, innovation, that long run economic growth is driven by innovation, by new ideas, by creativity, inventions which raise productivity, new goods, new systems of production, new technologies, new ideas. You know, if you go back to the Industrial Revolution, which started in England in the 18th century, and ask yourself, you know, that, that's kind of the start of all this prosperity in the modern world. You know, 30 to 250 years ago, life expectancy, you know, in Western Europe was about 30. That was more or less, uh, life expectancy at birth was about 30. That's more or less what it was at the time of the Roman Empire. You know, there was an enormous kind of stasis in living standards. Interesting stuff happened. You know, Rome went up and went down. Venice went up, it went down. You know, so there was, there was interesting stuff happened, but, but the long-run trend was very, very flat. And then the last 250 years, you've had these enormous, very unevenly distributed changes in living standards, okay? So what started all of that, at some level, was this Industrial Revolution. What was the Industrial Revolution? The Industrial Revolution is all about innovation. It was new ways of 
producing things, mechanization of production system, textile, weaving, uh, spin, cotton, spinning. It was new forms of power, the steam engine, new ways of organizing production, factory system, new, new methods of transportation, the railway. So it was all innovation. And so that's really important to kind of bear in mind when you think about what generates economic growth and what generates differences. It's all to do with innovation, new ideas, and that's, so keep that in mind, and I'm going to come back to it. All right, so let me go back to the Americas now and revisit this question of uh, what created this massive reversal in these initial conditions in the Americas over the past 500 years. So, so and I'll tell you a story to give you some sense about that, because I think, you know, what we argue in the book is that this is all to do with the way colonial society got organized in very different ways in different parts of the Americas. Uh, so what happened in the colonization? So let me tell you a story. I'll tell you two stories. One story about the colonization of Buenos Aires in Argentina by the Spanish, and another story about the colonization of the Americas by the English, by the Virginia Company in Jamestown. So when the Spanish first came to Buenos Aires, they sailed down the east coast of Latin America, they, uh, they, they set up a colony in Buenos Aires. They called it the Rio de la Plata, the river of silver, because they found some silver. The indigenous people had some silver and they got excited and they thought, oh, there's silver here, great, so let's set up a colony. Now, it turns out the silver didn't come from there. The silver came from right the way across the other side of Latin America, from Bolivia, and had been gradually traded, 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 and it had ended up in what's Argentina now. So there was no silver. The local indigenous people, who were called the Cheruas and the Kerandi, were hunter-gatherers. So they weren't sedentary, they didn't practice farming, you know, they roamed around, they were mobile. Uh, the Spanish, after they found, founded Buenos Aires, uh, basically tried to enslave these people, and they couldn't get them to work. They kind of ran away, and so the Spanish were not doing very well. They were sitting in Buenos Aires, you might think, gosh, you know, isn't this the pampa, fabulously productive, fertile land? That's not what the Spanish were interested in. They were interested in exploiting indigenous people and finding precious metals. So they set, sent out expeditions. And after a couple of years, one expedition sailed up the, the river Paraná and discovered in what's now Paraguay the Guarani. So the Guarani were a large, uh, densely, pop, densely settled agrarian society with hierarchy and chiefs and all the stuff that the Cheruas and the Kerandi didn't have. The Spanish abandoned Buenos Aires lock, stock, and barrel. It had to be refounded again later. And they sailed up the river and took over the Guarani. So, so, so they, and they set up a particular type of society. And let me just describe some of the things that the Spanish did with the Guarani, because they did it all over South America. Uh, they introduced what's called the encomienda. So the encomienda was, uh, you know, the, the, the way the Spanish, these conquistadors worked was uh, you put money up, you know, you invested in these expeditions, and the more you invested, the bigger share of the loot you got. So they wrote these contracts. Uh, which sort of divided up the loot. And so, encomienda, a grant of encomienda was basically a grant of indigenous people to a Spaniard. So you got, you know, and the more money you put in, the more indigenous people you got, and you were given control over in a large chunk of indigenous society. And what did you do with that control? Well, you used those people to produce stuff, food, goods, uh, you know, extract taxes, uh, tribute from the people. So, uh, if you look at the early economic institutions that the Spanish created in Paraguay, and I'll be more clear about what institutions are, but I just mean the kind of rules that govern society in the economy, they were all based on kind of exploiting and controlling the labor force, so systems of monopoly. Uh, there were rules, there was something called repartimiento, there's different sorts of repartimiento, but one of them involved forced uh, purchase of goods by indigenous people. Uh, there were all sorts of systems of forced labor. There was this encomienda. So, so, so the economy, to the, such as it was, was, all, was designed to sort of control and exploit the indigenous people for the benefit of this, these Spaniards. So what happened in uh, Virginia? Okay? Now you're thinking, okay, 1607, the English come, three boats show up, full of English men, mostly English men. There were very few women early on. Uh, they found the colony of Jamestown. You know, you can go see it. It's a sort of cute tourist destination in Virginia. So what happened in Jamestown? Now you're thinking, okay, fine. He was talking about the Spaniards. 
uh, you know, now it's the English people. The English people, they brought liberty and freedom and democracy and tolerance and, you know, tea and cucumber sandwiches and things like this, you know, cricket. Uh, so, so, but actually, that's not right at all. You know, what's really interesting is if you look at the origins of the Virginia Company and the colonization of Jamestown, they had a model. They had a model, a very explicit model about how you colonized in the Americas and how you created a society. And their model was taken lock, stock, and barrel from the Spanish. Okay? So, so and what did the Spanish do? Well, the first thing you do, first part of the playbook, is you capture the local indigenous chief. Okay? Once you capture the local indigenous chief, then you get a huge leverage over the indigenous society. So that's what they did in Paraguay. That's what uh, Pizarro did in Peru. That's what Jimenez de Quesada did in Colombia. That's what Cortes did in, when, he, when, they, when he captured uh, Mexico City. You capture the indigenous leader. And then, you know, you get them to bring tribute and you control and stuff. So, so the, the English landed in 1607. The first thing they tried to do was figure out, okay, who's the local indigenous leader here? Now, there was a chap, there was a chap called Wahun Sunakok, and Wahun Sunakok was in charge of a loose kind of confederation of tribes called the Powhatan Confederation. So he lived quite close to Jamestown, and they said, you know, come to, they got in touch with him. They'd already, uh, they sent off, uh, they came, you know, it's a complicated story, I won't tell you all the details, but they had some captured indigenous people who they could use to communicate with Wahun Sunakok. So they told Wahun Sunakok, you know, come to, come to Jamestown and things like that. And he was like, no, 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 you, no, 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 I'm not coming there. You can, he was very suspicious, come, you know, you can come to me. So the first sort of 1607, 1608, they're trying to capture Wahun Sunakok. They go and see him, you know, they, but they, then they go away and they're trying to trade and they're trying to figure out the lay of the land. And then the second winter they're there, two thirds of the English starved to death, okay? So they, what starved to death? Why on earth did they starve to death? Well, they didn't bother planting any crops. The first year, they basically lived off the food they bought from England, and then they, didn't have, and then they ran out, and they hadn't bothered planting anything, and they starved to death. So why did they starve to death? Because the, you didn't colonize the Americas by working. The, the Indians did that. You let them do the work, and you exploited them. So, so it's, it's a dramatic example of how they came with the same model, but the thing is, the mo the, you know, Virginia was a sort of a bit like Buenos Aires without the Guarani. So, you know, the, if the Spanish had had to cope in Buenos Aires, they'd have had the same problem that the Virginia Company did, which was the indigenous population was very thinly spread on the ground. It wasn't organized into kind of hierarchical societies like the Guarani or the Mexicas or the Incas or whatever. So, so then, so this is a, you know, two thirds of the people starved to death. The whole Jamestown project is sort of about to collapse. So more settlers come. The Jamestown Company was a profit-making enterprise. So they weren't interested in bringing peace or liberty. They were out to make money, just like the conquistadors. So, so then the, the governors of the Jamestown colony are sitting around in London, and they sort of say, the Virginia Company that started Jamestown, look, this isn't working. It's not viable to set up a colony and exploit indigenous people. This is not Mexico. We need a plan B. Okay? So plan B was as follows. Okay, so we can't exploit the indigenous people. Let's exploit the English people. So they sent out a new governor and they passed a new set of regulations. Okay? And the first regulation from this, uh, you can download it from the Yale. Yale has a wonderful project with a lot of these colonial documents uh, up there. So you can download all these regulations from the Yale webpage. And uh, we have the URL in the, in the appendix of the book. So, and the first regulation said, anyone who goes off and lives with the indigenous people, the Indians, uh, is punishable by death. So why on earth would that be the first rule? Well, it was the first rule because, because you know, as soon as you started, as soon as they started trying to exploit the indigenous people, they ra the English people, sorry, the English people, they ran off into the, they said, oh, to hell with this, we're not staying in Jamestown, let's go and live with the Indians. So they left and they found themselves an Indian wife and they settled down and they just abandoned the whole thing. So when this new governor, Thomas Gale came, he tried, you know, he separated, the, the, everyone into barracks, nobody can eat unless they worked, and they introduced this draconian sort of labor regime. And the English people, you know, you just, the English people are notoriously hard to exploit. So there were two big problems, you know, uh, there were three big problems. One, there's a, one problem is the English people are just, you know, hard to exploit. Uh, the other problem was they ran away. So people ran away uh, into the forest to live with the Indians. The third problem was, of course, they realized after a couple of years of doing this that 
if you can't have a viable colony by exploiting indigenous people, you have to get the English people to work somehow, and you have to get more English people to come. So at this point, there was only a few hundred people there. You need, more, you need to get more people to come, but it's very hard to get more people to come if you're exploiting like mad the ones that are there already. So this sort of struggle went on for a few years, and then they decided, okay, so plan A didn't work, plan B didn't work, we need plan C. Plan C turned out to be of momentous significance for the history of the United States, which is, we can't exploit the Indians, we can't exploit the English people, so let's try something else. Let's try giving them incentives. So, so they freed everybody from their labor contract. So a lot of these people were what called indent indentured laborers, so you would you would sell yourself to work for seven years for the Virginia Company in exchange for a free passage. So people didn't have money to pay. So you work for seven years. So they had these contracts of indenture. They freed everyone from their labor contracts. They gave everyone 50 acres of land. If you could persuade somebody else to come from England, you got another 50 acres for each person you persuaded to come. And they sort of said, OK, let's, let's incentivize these people. Let's give them land. Let's, let's let them get them to work. Now, what was in that for the Virginia Company? Well, the Virginia Company also owned lots of land. In fact, at that point, the Virginia Company was kind of maintaining the fiction that most of the eastern United States was like their land. They didn't really have an effective way of controlling it, of course, but they, had, they were sort of had this fiction that, that this, is, you know, this is our land. So they thought, okay, great, these people will start working, you know, and it's going to raise the value of our land, and we can make some money you know, that way, sort of indirectly. And so they went from a society based on sort of coercion to one based on incentives and opportunities as a way of kind of making the colony work. And they backed it up by what? By introducing in 1619 a general assembly which gave all adult males political rights. So the idea here was sort of, well, we need to make this credible. We need people to really believe that the society's changed, so we're going to let people decide on the rules themselves. So they just decentralized all the power to the adult males there. So this was not implantation of English institutions, adult males in England didn't get the right to vote until after the First World War, all adult males. So this is a radical change in, you know, a, very, it's a radical emergence of a very different type of society from England in this colonial uh, context, okay? It's not the only place it happened. If you look in the book, we also talk about Australia in the late 18th and early 19th century, uh, and something very similar happened in Australia, which is almost a kind of more interesting example because Australia started out as a penal colony so it was even more kind of coercive to start with than... Uh, that's my major Greek experience, actually. You know, I used to teach at the University of Melbourne. I think there's more Greeks in Melbourne than there is in Greece nowadays. So I remember, you know. Okay, so, 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 so something... Two very different types of societies emerged in uh, North America and South America. Now you're sort of saying, okay, gosh, he's talking about the early 17th century or he's talking about the 16th century. That's an awful long time ago, isn't it? So what we do in the first chapter of the book is we sort of try to show you how these initial divergent, this initial divergence between these two types of colonial society reproduced themselves over time in many ways. Okay? And in fact, we kind of take the story right the way up until the present and we show, you know, I get, you know, I ask that we ask the question, think of the two richest people in the world, which is Bill Gates and Carlos uh, Slim, and ask yourself how they made their money, okay? Bill Gates made his money by innovating. You know, of course, he wanted to be a monopolist. Everybody wants to be a monopolist. You know, professors want to be intellectual monopolists. You're a businessman, of course you want to be a, you want to be a monopolist. You know, I was, I was in Mexico last year. I gave an address about the book to the Senate in Mexico, and I had a dinner with all these businessmen. And this one businessman told me something very funny. He said, you know, you shouldn't be so tough on Carlos Slim. Everybody wants to be like that. He's just better at it than we are. <laughs> so, so, so that's, you know, what did, what did Carlos Slim do? Carlos Slim did not innovate like Bill Gates. It's all about monopolies. Carlos Slim made a vast fortune by, by creating monopolies. Now, he's a brilliant businessman also. I'm not saying Carlos Slim is not. He's a brilliant businessman, just like Bill Gates is. But the thing is, in Mexico, the, your energies and talent and creativity are pushed into creating monopolies and getting monopolies and extracting rents. Whereas in the United States, the way to get really rich is to be, in, is to be an innovator. So, so I think that tells you everything about how some, there's something very different about the incentive structure in the United States, uh, which pushes people's energy and creativity in very different dimensions than it does in 
Mexico. You know, Colombia, I work a lot in Colombia and South America. You know, I could make a list for you of like the 30 richest people in Colombia. Every single one of them made their money basically as, through some type of monopoly. It's beer, it's banking, it's finance, it's uh, cement, it's, you know, whatever it is, retail. It's, it's all creating, getting monopolies. Okay, that's not the way you make money uh, in the United States. So, so that example, I think, that's very, very telling about the difference uh, between the United States and Latin American countries. And that, those differences are deeply rooted in this history. Let me give you one more example uh, before I kind of back, back up a little bit and, and sort of abstract our theory from this discussion, which is in the 19th. So let me give you a 19th century example, something in between you know, Jamestown and Bill Gates. So in the 19th century, and this is a good place to give this story since we're at Harvard, in the 19th century, you know, there was this Western expansion in the US. So there was a famous Harvard historian called Frederick Jackson Turner, who wrote a book called The Frontier in American History, which was all about how this Western expansion in the US sort of was what created such a unique society. So I already, you know, suggested I don't think that's true at all. The United States was very different way before frontier expansion took place. But Jackson Turner's argument was this Western expansion created you know, a society which was very democratic. There was a lot of social mobility and opportunity. And that imparted a particular character to US society. So it's, it's a fun book. You know. uh, the only problem with that argument is that uh, more or less every Latin American country had a frontier expansion in the same period. You know, this was the world was developing very rapidly. Europe was growing. Transportation costs were falling. Steamships, all of this was happening. So there was a huge demand for these agricultural products that were being produced in these areas. But that just wasn't, it wasn't just the US, it wasn't just Chicago and St. Louis. It was Argentina, it was Guatemala, it was Mexico, it was Colombia, it was Chile. They all had frontier expansions as well. But the type of frontier expansion they had was incredibly different. There's no frontier myth in Chile or Guatemala or Mexico about how frontier expansion created this social mobility and democracy and blah, blah, blah. Why was that? because frontier expansion took place in a very, very different way. If you look at the history of frontier expansion in the United States, it goes back to the Northwest Ordinances in 1785, right the way through to the Homestead Act in 1862, essentially opened up the frontier. The frontier, of course, was not really the frontier. It was full of indigenous people who got treated very badly. But, you know, so I'm, I, you know, I don't want to say anything about, if you look at the history of the Americas, just like every colonial society, indigenous people did very badly. I think the crucial thing about the United States is that it wasn't possible to construct a society based on the exploitation of indigenous people that was critical. So, yeah, in the 19th century, frontier expansion led to the expropriation of the Sioux and the Cheyenne and the Arapaho and the Apache and everybody else. You know, but, 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 but the big story, I think, in terms of trying to understand economic development of the United States, you know, about welfare of the indigenous people, that's a different, that's an important story, but it's a different story, is that these laws going back from the 18th century through to the Homestead Act in 1862 opened up the frontier in a very egalitarian way, okay? You got to file for 60, you could get 60 acres of land, you know, you could file, you got a title, you know, it was a very egalitarian uh, system, okay? Everyone had access to this. You could go, you could get your land, file the title, the state enforced it, etc. In Latin America, why don't you have a myth of the egalitarian frontier promoting social mobility? Because frontier expansion was ridiculously oligarchized. In Chile, for example, Chile, in the modern, modern Chile, you know, uh, if, you go, if you look at where the Santiago, the capital is, south of Santiago is along, the kind of central valley goes all the way down to a city called Puerto Montt. The, Halfway down that, there's a river that cuts across it called the Bio Bio. Chile stopped at the Bio Bio until the middle of the 19th century. And after then, the, the, the south of the Bio Bio was full of indigenous people. After the 1850s, the Chilean state, with the help of the Winchester rifle, uh, moved south. They took all this land. What did they do with this land? The land was auctioned off in massive tracts to politically connected elites in Santiago. Okay? Something completely different from what happened in the US. So, and I want to emphasize two elements of that story, which are really, so I think that, you know, why is that, what, why was that story important? I think that story is important in kind of giving you some sense of how these conditions reproduce themselves over time. What's important about the story of Jamestown is that a society emerges where political power is quite broadly spread across adult males, uh, uh, and economic opportunities are quite 
broadly spread. And the frontier, I'm going to come back to this a little bit in a minute when I describe the general theory in more detail. The frontier expansion in the US and the form it took is a sort of reproduces these conditions in a very interesting way. Whereas Latin American society is very oligarchic, very oligarchic, it's very unequal, and frontier expansion is an example of how that oligarchic, unequal way of, that society functioned reproduced itself all, all over time, right the way up to uh, Carlos Slim. Okay, so, so let me back up and sort of say, you know, Latin American case is interesting, you know, because it allows me to use this dichotomy, you know, sort of something's, the United States is growing, something's going on, Latin America's not growing, so it's a dichotomy. Dichotomies are always too simple, right? There's always sort of nuance and shades of gray and things like that. And of course, you know, uh, so let me, you know, I can talk about nuance and shades of gray, but I think it's useful for developing the argument to talk about this dichotomy. So in the book we say, you know, what's crucial about driving economic growth in the United States is that a particular type of organization of society, what we call institutions, the rules that create opportunities and incentives for people, they were, uh, we call those, they were inclusive. Okay, they were inclusive in the sense that they created broad-based incentives for people to work, to innovate, to save, invest, and they created, you know, broad opportunities. Okay, so, so, so broad spread opportunities. So, so we call those economic institutions that create broad-based incentives and opportunities inclusive. So where does this word inclusive come from? Well, let me give you a very specific example which I can tie back to the work of Robert Solow. If you look in the 19th century, so in the 19th century, the US becomes the world's uh, most you know, successful economy. Uh, how does it do that? Well, a lot of it is innovation, okay? And what do you do when you come up with an idea? You know, what did Edison do when he invented the light bulb? He took out a patent, okay? And patents are very interesting uh, documents. What does a patent do? A patent is meant to protect your intellectual property rights to create incentives for innovation, okay? So, so and what's interesting about the patent system, there's two things that are interesting about it. First of all, the patent system was very inclusive in the sense that it didn't matter who you were. You know, you could be English, you could be Greek, you could be, I don't know, maybe if you were a slave, it didn't work so well, you know. But, uh, but uh, that's part of the nuance. You know, the U.S. had slavery, but the important thing is that just like you couldn't create a society based on exploitation of indigenous people in the United States, Slavery emerged in the South after these institutions got organized early on. And, you know, and slavery was a huge drag on the United States. There's no doubt about that. So, so, but the patent system, leaving aside you know, issues of slaves, the patent system, you know, it didn't matter who you were, you could pay a fee, you could get a patent, and you could get the state to protect your intellectual property rights, irrespective of who you were. So, and who were these people who took out patents. So there's a very interesting work by economic historians looking at the social background of patentees. And what you see is that patentees, people who took out patents, come from all over the social spectrum. So elites, non-elites, poor people, rich people, farmers, artisans, professional people. 25% of the patentees in the United States in the 19th century were even like uneducated. Okay? So I mean, that's quite, you know, US was way ahead of Latin America, for example, in terms of education. But even uneducated people took out patents. So what does that tell you? It tells you that ideas, skills, entrepreneurship, energy, creativity are very broadly spread in society. And if you want to have a dynamic economic society, you need to find a way of harnessing all that latent talent in society. And I think the patent system was one very good example of how that worked in the US. The US was very good at uh, doing that. You know, and it, it remains... Today, you know, uh, I always, th one of the things I find most interesting about the United States, you know, being English, is the extent to which in the U.S. there's still this incredible ability to absorb, you know, foreigners. You know, it's the, it's the outstanding country in the world in terms of absorbing people from all over the world. Doesn't matter what they do, who they're from, black, white, yellow, whatever, you know. Th this is the one country in the world which does a much better job at absorbing uh, much better than European countries do at absorbing foreigners. And that's a huge, huge plus for the long-run economic potential of the United States still today. So, so, so we call those economic institutions like this patent system, we call those inclusive. So in, you, know, you can hear the idea, you know, inclusive, why? Because 
because they had this property of tapping into this latent talent in society. So that's inclusive economic institutions. So what is it that they had in Latin America? Well, I'm going to call those extractive economic institutions. So labor coercion, monopolies, you know, those are, those are extractive. So inclusive and extractive. So, so the first pass at, you know, why did, the Latin, why did North America become so much richer than Latin America, you know, over the last two, three hundred years? Because inclusive economic institutions got set up in the United States, whereas in most parts of Latin America, these extractive economic institutions got set up. But that, you know, so that, if that was what the book was about, that would be really boring. Uh, but what's more interesting about that is, you know, so I could look around the world and sort of say, okay, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, that does very badly economically because it has extractive economic institutions. Or, you know, uh, Northern Europe does well because it has inclusive economic institutions. Fine. But what lies behind that? What explains all this variation in the world in economic institutions and performance? Well, I gave you one very specific story about the development of colonial institutions in the Americas. But of course, there's many different paths to inclusive and extractive institutions. And it's not just to do with colonialism. So what, we, what I want to emphasize is the politics that lies behind institutions. So what's kind of crucial about the what created the type of, what created extractive institutions in Latin America, what was crucial about driving that was a particular type of politics. And in particular, the very, the, the narrow dominance of a kind of colonial elite over the rest of society, okay? So, so the emphasis, the sort of the generalization in the book is to say, what creates inclusive economic institutions is actually a particular type of politics. We call that inclusive political institutions. What creates extractive economic institutions is extractive political institutions. So let me explain, you know, the two, there's two dimensions of inclusive political institutions, and they both came up in my discussion so far. You know, why was it that the Homestead Act got passed in the United States and not in Colombia or Paraguay? Well, that was because, you know, in 1862, white males could already vote in the United States. Well, women couldn't vote, you know, black people uh, couldn't vote. But white suffrage was a very, quite, very broad distribution, white male adult suffrage was a very broad distribution of political rights in the 19th century compared to more or less anywhere in the world. So the Homestead Act, which opened up the frontier in an egalitarian and inclusive way, the reason that got passed was because political power was broadly distributed in the US. So that's part of the story of inclusive political institutions. You need to have broad distribution of power in society. The other part of that also comes out in the discussion of the Homestead Act. It wasn't just that the US passed the Homestead Act. It was that the state enforced it. So the US also had an effective centralized state. There's another bizarre myth in the United States that the US state in the 19th century was kind of small and weak and didn't do anything, which, which is absolutely not nonsense. You know, if you look at the postal service, for example, the US had this extraordinary postal service. You know, by the 1820s and 1830s, the postal service was just everywhere. If you read de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, for instance, he discusses a lot this amazing postal service. You know, the postal service, the postal service is absolutely fundamental in creating a national identity, a public sphere, in broadcasting the kind of the power, you know, of the state, the army, the railways, the, you know, so yeah, there was no income tax in the US until 1913. But, you know, there's lots of different ways of funding and doing things. For example, how did the US build railways? Okay, so the government didn't build railways, but they, they came up with a very clever scheme for incentivizing the private sector to build railways and build infrastructure by giving away huge amounts of land on either side of the railroad and creating incentives for private company to produce quality and build the infrastructure. So, so, so there's lots of ways of doing things. I just, so I want to say that the US central state was very effective also at implementing uh, policy. So, 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 so there's two, so we talk about these two dimensions, this broad distribution of political power and having an effective central state, we call that inclusive political institutions. And you know, what happens if either of those things fail, we call those extractive political institutions. So that's the sort of theory in a nutshell. I don't want to talk too long. The theory in a nutshell is sort of, you know, poor country, you know, we have one chapter which we call, you know, uh, you know, sort of why nations fail today, and we go around the world and we look at North Korea, 
you know, Zimbabwe, Sierra Leone, Argentina, Colombia, Egypt, you know, and these are all countries with very different cultures, very different histories. You know, you might say, gosh, you know, North Korea isn't that some tin pot dictatorship or Cuba, that's kind of socialist or, you know, whatever. And we say, you know, look, uh, these countries all differ in terms of their institutions, their history, their culture, but you can see the problems of poverty and economic development all stem from the fact that they have extractive economic institutions underpinned by extractive political institutions. The details of those economic institutions are going to look very different. You know, the economic institutions in North Korea are very different from economic institutions in Colombia or Uzbekistan. And the politics is also, you know, the political institutions, the details look very different. But we try to say, you know, you can think about that through this lens of extractive political institutions, extractive economic institutions, creating, you know, the absence of incentives and broad-based uh, opportunities. Okay, so, so, so a lot of the book is a historical discussion trying to tell a story about, you know, why did the world end up looking like it did? Why did, it, why did Africa or South Asia end up with extractive economic and political institutions and North America or Northern Europe not? You know, and telling a story about the divergence of how institutions drifted apart or diverged historically between different parts of the world. And that involves, you know, lots of idiosyncratic things. You know, if I was going to tell you a story about the history of, you know, Africa, then, you know, that would be a history about the slave trade. It would be a history about the impact of, you know, lots of institutions which were quite idiosyncratic to African history, but nevertheless left a long shadow, okay? So, so let, me tell, let me just end by talking a little bit about, you know, about institutional change and, you know, What's the problem of uh, poor countries in this perspective? So from this perspective, you know, uh, you know in some sense, the, 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 the economic history over the last 250 years looks something like this. You know, uh, inclusive economic and political institutions emerged in Britain in the early modern period. And that kind of followed a particular path of first political change leading to economic change, okay? And that's very much what we emphasize in the book, how political change typically precipitates economic change. You can think of economics and politics as sort of interrelated, but our research, you know, our, both our kind of scientific research and our d understanding of a lot of the history, tend, we tend to emphasize the sort of primacy of political change leading to economic change. So these changes take place in England that creates this economic transformation in terms of technology, in terms of productivity, enhancing, in, you know, innovations, and that spreads very unevenly across the world as a function of this kind of map of institutions that you have, you know, in 1800, let's say. Some parts of the world have developed inclusive institutions like North America by a very different route than Britain did, and they start to have benefit straight away. You know, the Industrial Revolution spreads very rapidly to Massachusetts. You know, you can go up to Lowell. If you haven't never been to Lowell, Massachusetts, there's a wonderful functioning textile mill. You know, by the 1820s, the economy was, industrial economy was booming in Massachusetts. That's because the United States had already developed these inclusive institutions. Textile production, railroads, steam engine, all that stuff, that didn't spread to Colombia because Colombia had these extractive institutions. It just so, so this institutional map created this very uneven diffusion of all these new technologies. And that situation has been very persistent over the last 250 years. You know, if I took all the countries in the Americas and I sort of said, okay, let's look today and we rank them by their institutions, you know, and we start at the top, you know, the U.S., Canada, you know, uh, Chile, let's say, you know, and we go down that list and we go, end up at the bottom with, you know, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Haiti or whatever. You know, if we went back 50 years, that ranking would be almost identical. If we went back 100 years or 150 years, that ranking would be almost identical as well. You know, Argentina goes up and down and, you know, but actually the big picture about Argentina is Argentina has always been more prosperous than most countries in Latin America, it's been more educated, it's been more functional, it has kind of mad, you know, mad politics, uh, uh, but, 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 you know, it's always been much richer and more successful even when it's been going down than Guatemala or Haiti or El Salvador or Colombia or Peru or Bolivia or, so, so why do I 
give that example because I think that shows you there's some very, very enduring problem there. That once societies get set up in a particular way, you know, that tends to persist. So in the book, we have two chapters where we talk about the vicious circle and the virtuous circle. And the virtuous circle is how you get a society like the United States, you know, there's all sorts of feedback loops and forces which tend to keep inclusive institutions going. You know, that's why, you know, I'm a, I'm a relative optimist about the United States. I don't believe all this stuff about how the United States is going down the toilet, you know, which is, you can go to the Harvard bookshop and buy this book by my good friend Thomas Piketty called Capital, you know, which is all about how the United States is becoming oligarchized, you know, and turning into a kind of banana republic. You know, but I don't, I don't think that's true at all. I think it's kind of nonsense. I think what we show in the book is that in the past, the US system has faced all sorts of challenges. You know, go back to the Gilded Age, the robber baron, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, all these people. You know, they were trying to oligarchize the politics and economics of the United States, but they failed. You know, go back to the 1930s, you see the same thing. You know, there were all sorts of pressures on the system, but the institutions were strong enough to kind of bounce back. And I think once you're in that equilibrium, then it's, it's, it's possible, you know, it's possible that it could be derailed. You know, we, in the book, we discuss the example of Venice. You know, in the medieval world, Venice was probably the most prosperous, Venice was the most prosperous place in Europe. It might have been the most prosperous place in the world, you know, based on this incredibly dynamic trading economy. But it oligarchized and it went into reverse, you know. You could say the same thing about, you know, the Greeks, but that was the Romans' fault, wasn't it? So, you know, <laughs> nobody invaded Venice. Nobody invaded Venice and nobody invaded the United States. So, so the Greeks are off the hook. <laughs> okay, so, 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 I, you know, so we talk about this. I'm just, you know, just, if you just thought about the history of the Americas, I'm just trying to say there's enormous forces leading this to persist. So that suggests, you know, let me finish by just talking about that it's very difficult to change this. You know, so if you're a, if you're a country like Colombia, you know, where, you know, the state is very weak, it's very ineffective, it doesn't have a monopoly of violence, it's very bad at raising taxes, it doesn't have a bureaucracy that works very well, it's incredibly patrimonial, half of the people in the civil service are just there because some politician gave them a job, you know, they don't have any qualifications, they weren't meritocratically appointed, they have no incentives to do anything, they have no competence to do the job they're supposed to be doing. You know, in the last Colum Colombian government, for example, the flagship program was something called the National Consolidation Plan. So the National Consolidation Plan was an attempt to sort of extend the state into rural areas where it's never been. Until, you know, until 10 years ago, there was about 30% of the municipalities in Colombia never didn't have a police station. You know, there was no police, there was no state, there was no government, there was just people surviving on their own. So they introduced this national consolidation plan, you know, to sort of extend the state into these rural areas. The president changed, a new president came in. What did he do? Well, he fired the guy who was in charge of this flagship policy and replaced him with his campaign manager from this state in the south of Colombia. Someone who was completely unqualified to do the job, but suddenly they were running this huge program. They had no qualifications. It was just a sheer patronage appointment. So, you know, the state fails in, to be all sorts of, in, in all sorts of ways. And that's how it's always been in Colombia. That's how it's been for 200 years. That's the way the state's been organized. That's the way how politics has worked. Uh, you know, there's a democracy, but the democracy is very imperfect. There's huge amounts of fraud. There's huge amounts of vote buying and clientelism. So there's very little accountability in the political system. So you have a democracy, but it's a very dysfunctional type of democracy. And that's a, so what we emphasize, this is a very stable situation. So this is not a very inclusive society, but it's a very stable situation. And it's very difficult to push that out towards something more inclusive. So how could that happen? Well, my last word. Uh, how could that happen? Well, uh, in the book, we actually emphasize a lot conflict over institutions. And if you look historically at institutional transitions, they're often driven by conflict. Okay? How did England develop inclusive political institutions? That was really in the Civil War of the 1640s and the Glorious Revolution, which was another civil war in 1688. And let me tell you a little bit about the Glorious Revolution, since we talk about that in the book. That created a transition from much more extractive to much more inclusive political institutions. Okay? Now, conflict over political institutions obviously doesn't necessarily lead to anything better. You know, Latin America is the, is the you know, it's, it's a subcontinent of revolutions. Every Latin American country in the 19th century had 10, 
15 civil wars, revolutions. They rewrote the Constitution, you know, numerous times. I think the Dominican Republic kind of wins for the mo At some point, it rewrote the Constitution eight times in a span of about 25 years. That didn't create an inclusive society, okay? So it's not conflict per se that creates a transition to a more inclusive society. It's certain types of conflict we emphasize. And in particular, we emphasize, you know, who is in conflict with whom, and what you see, and this is a very kind of empirical generalization in situations where we observe a transition from extractive to more inclusive institutions, we say, you know, that typically involves what we call a broad coalition, okay? So let me motivate the broad coalition with this, six, with this glorious revolution example. So James II was the king of England, and James II was, every, was antagonizing lots of people, and one way he was antagonizing them was he was intervening in legal decisions. So he'd intervene, somebody, some judge made a decision he didn't like, he'd intervene in the father judge and appoint a new judge. So that created a lot of antagonism in society. Imagine we're here, you know, in Harvard Hall, we're upset about James II, and I'm trying to get you to organize collectively, to mobilize guys in the streets, let's, let's, get, let's get society mobilized, you know, like the Arab Spring, against James II. Now, what could I do? I could sort of say, well, James II, he's intervening in the legal system, and we don't like that. If we get rid of him and we're in power, then we'll get the legal decisions we like. You know, we'll be the one appointing the judges and firing judges if we don't get a deal we like. And that'll be great, won't it? Isn't that an incentive to get rid of James II? So that's, that's an example of what we call the iron law of oligarchy. You know, that's just what's been happening in Egypt. You know, the, the, the Mubarak regime gets kicked out. They get replaced by a bunch of Islamicists. You know, and they're like, now we're on top, great. You know, we can do what we like. Before the military were doing what, what they liked, now we're, we're gonna do what we like. And that turned out not to be stable because they couldn't get the military control and then now we're back to square one in Egypt. Now, what would stop that logic applying, okay? Well, imagine there were lots of us involved in this thing. Now, I could say, you know, I'm gonna give, we, if we get into power, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you the legal, the legal decisions you want. But then I'll give you the legal decisions you want and you the legal decisions you want. But the more, the more of us who are involved in this, what we call a broad coalition, that becomes infeasible. I mean, what happens if you two are in a dispute? I can't help both of you. So, so it becomes more and more difficult to sort of, you know, favor, you can't give out these favors in this, in a kind of broader scope. So our idea is to sort of say, you know, what you see in the Glorious Revolution and other instances, we talk about a few others in the book, like this transition in Brazil in the 1970s and 80s, is you see, a very heterogeneous group of people involved in kind of opposing some extractive set of political institutions. And then it gets very difficult to sort of come up with a, with a sort of strategy for gaining support which involves everybody getting what they want. So instead, you know, what you see in this conflict against James II is much broader kind of principles emerge, which is something tantamount to the rule of law. I can't offer you all favors, but what I could suggest is let's have a kind of level playing field, we'll have the rule of law. So nobody gets, I can't offer you all favors, but let's say no one gets favors. That's better than what's happening under James II. And so that emerges as a sort of way of mobilizing this coalition against James II. And we try to show in the book that when you get these transitions towards more inclusive society, it's because you get this broad-based mobilization uh, that then takes over and kind of institutionalizes that in the political system. So, so let me, you know, but, but the book is often, you know, is often attacked for being very pessimistic, you know, because of this sense that these, it's very difficult to change these societies, which is kind of ironic, you know, because when Ashimolu and I, when we first started doing research on this stuff 20 years ago, we, were, we, we mobilized a lot of this stuff to attack this geographical view of development, which I thought, which we both thought was ridiculous, you know, this idea that somehow countries in the tropics were intrinsically poor, or Greece was poorer than Germany because it was closer to the equator. You know, we just thought this was ridiculous. This is like the most deterministic theory of all time. So we thought our theory was kind of really optimistic compared to this geographical theory. But after we demolished the geographical theory, everyone said we were pessimistic now. So, can't win. Okay. We're going to change now. We're going to move to the second part of the conference and where you want to introduce our student entrepreneurs. First, I'd like to introduce uh, my friend Stefan Yapis. Um, so, Stefan attended uh, Yale College and graduated in 2010 at the top of his department, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. He also received his master's degree in biology from Yale University and graduated as the student marshal of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, 
with the highest GPA. He is currently a doctoral candidate in the Harvard Molecular and Cellular Biology Department, working in the lab of John Rin, studying how non-coding RNAs function and how dysregulation of those RNAs can lead to mammalian disease. He will be talking to us, to, he'll, he will be talking to us today about the pivotal, pivotal sector of the Greek economy, namely the agricultural sector. So, Stefan. Uh, so I'm a PhD student in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology here at Harvard. Um, I did come from Yale, so I hope you don't all boo me off the stage. But um, uh, I'm going to be talking not about my research on mammalian disease today, but about a different passion of mine, specifically um, agriculture. So I'm going to be the title of my talk today is A New Century in Greek Agriculture. So uh, you might be asking yourself, why would a PhD student in molecular biology be interested in agriculture? Um, well, before I get into that, I first want to lay of the land, get the lay of the land of Greek agriculture out to you. So about 30% of Greeks, uh, Greece's land is farmable. This is about 15,000 square miles. Agribusiness is a very critical sector um, for, Greek, for the Greek economy, making up about 4% of the GDP and employing about 12% of the workforce. Greek uh, agriculture faces several significant hurdles that a lot of other countries don't have to deal with. Specifically, uh, the Greek cl uh, climate is a chaparral climate and is characterized by thin soils that are very low in nutrients. The most important nutrient that we'll be talking about today is nitrogen, which is critical for plant growth. Additionally, uh, the Greek climate has low levels of precipitation relative to places like the U.S., and so they have to combat with that as well. And finally, the Greek agribusiness sector is really characterized primarily by small fragmented farms rather than large cultivable sectors of land. And so you have individual farmers uh, who have to deal with poor soils on an individual basis, and that kind of breaks up their economy. And so when I say that I'm passionate about agriculture, I don't really just mean agriculture. I mean um, I'm more specifically interested in how we can improve productivity while simultaneously reducing the impacts on the environment of uh, agricultural productivity. And so the simplest way that I can talk about this is through what is commonly known as organic agriculture. And so, again, we should probably get a lay of the land of the uh, patterns and trends in Greek organic agriculture before moving forward with the talk. So in 2000, uh, Greece had a grand total of less than 1% of its far uh, cultivated land dedicated to organic agriculture. This is actually what the U.S. currently has dedicated to organic agriculture. So Greece is about 15 years ahead of the U.S. in terms of its sustainability. By 2010, Greece had moved up to 8.4% of its cultivated land to organic agriculture. This was a greater than 1,000% increase, and the PowerPoint is a little messy there, but um, which outstripped any other developed country in the entire world. The next highest was Portugal, which had an increase over the same time period of 400%. So Greece more than doubled them in terms of their increase in sustainability over 10 years. By 2012, that had reduced to 5.2%. So we had a, uh, about 40% decrease in the amount of land dedicated to organic agriculture in two years. Now, obviously, we know we had some kind of financial issues that we were dealing with, um, but this really raises a couple of key points about the views toward sustainability and the views toward productivity in the agriculture market that I think are worth considering. So really, sustainability takes a backseat to uh, productivity in financially tough times. Yes? Can't hear me. Okay. Is this not working? This might not be on. This is off? There we go. There we go. We could we hit the on button. Is it better? Thank you. Good. Okay. Can everyone else hear me? <laughs> um, so when we're talking about how sustainability takes a backseat to productivity in financially tough times, there are two views that we're combating here. The first is that eco-friendliness is a lower priority relative to productivity and profits. This is kind of obvious. People who are interested in agribusiness are more interested in generating profits than they are in saving the planet. The second uh, view that we have to combat is that organic production is inherently less profitable than inorganic production. And so when I'm talking about organic versus inorganic, what I mean is that um, inorganic is the traditional method of agri agribusiness where um, fertilizers that are applied are typically made up of synthetic forms of nitrogen and phosphorus versus organic, which are you know organic sources or more natural sources and are almost entirely limited to biomass. 
And so we have to, uh, one question that we can ask right off the bat is, what are the flaws of the current system that contribute to these views? And so when I usually give this talk, um, it's either for a group of venture capitalists or it's for a group of chemists. And so I'm trying to give a mixture of both in this talk. So um, this is a pretty simple diagram of the chemistry of inorganic fertilizers and how they pass through ecosystems. So if we start off um, at the top uh, where the tractor is and we apply an inorganic fertilizer, that's typically applied in the form of ammonium. Now ammonium uh, cannot be directly taken up by plants. That has to be processed in a multi-step uh, in a multi-step process um, called nitrification to a point that plants can actually absorb it. Now during this process, ammonium can run off into water systems in a process called leaching and actually end up in groundwater, um, eventually making its way into uh, marine ecosystems, eventually leading to something called eutrophication, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But really, there's an inefficiency here because there's this multi-step process before uh, the fertilizer that you apply to a soil can be taken up by the plant. Which I'll talk, and, and that really comes into play in Greece's specific situation in a little bit, which I'll talk about. So if you've taken an economics class, you know that there are external costs associated with any process that you might, or any purchase that you might make. And there are external costs that are tied into the fertilizer market as well. So there's an external cost associated with the production of inorganic fertilizers. The first is that ammonium-based products, like ammonium nitrate, are notoriously known to explode. So if you remember last year, in April of 2013, there was a major explosion at a Texas ammonium nitrate factory that was manufacturing fertilizers. And it killed 14 people and, made, and caused millions of dollars worth of damage to the town, something that would be easily avoidable if we weren't using these synthetic forms of nitrogen. Additionally, Synthetic forms of phosphorus uh, come from strip mining events that absolutely decimate ecosystems, uh, cause uh, untold amounts of environmental damage, uh, lead to groundwater pollution, and are just generally unsightly. In addition to the external costs associated with uh, inorganic fertilizer production, there are uh, external costs associated with inorganic fertilizer use, specifically eutrophication, like I talked about earlier. So what happens if you get large amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus running off of ecosystems ending up in groundwater. Well, these two images really indicate stuff that can happen when nutrients run into the groundwater. On the left, you see a green algal bloom that is effectively choking the, uh, this marine ecosystem. And on the right, you see a red tide. Both of these are caused by nitrogen leaching into groundwater and causing overgrowth of the algal populations essentially eliminating any oxygen in those water sources and killing all of the life that exists in those marine populations. So the question that we have to ask here is, why do we get nutrient runoff uh, when we're using inorganic fertilizers? And so I promise this is as much chemistry or biology as I'm going to bring up in this talk. Um, but we have two panels here. Do I have a pointer? I do have a pointer. Okay, so over here we have a fungal cell, and over here we have a plant cell, and there's a little bridge here. This bridge symbolizes the fact that this fungal cell and the plant cell exist in a symbiosis, where the fungal cell is capable of taking up nitrate and ammonium over here and processing it in a multi-step pathway to glutamine and finally arginine um, in a process called the glutamate synthase pathway, which I won't go into any detail for. But Following this pathway here, we get arginine, a basic amino acid that can then be imported into the plant cell for use in growth, productivity, and crop production. And so, oh, that got kind of messed up. So the uh, runoff problems are really uh, exacerbated in Greece because we have a thin organic soil layer in a chaparral ecosystem, like I mentioned, and we have low nutrient levels, which means that got cut off. Uh, but that means fewer mycorrhizae. And so what am, I, what am I talking about here? So if you apply nitrates and ammonium to a soil, it can't be taken up directly by the plant. You need to have this symbiosis between the fungus and the plant in order for those nutrients to be absorbed. In a low nutrient ecosystem or a, an ecosystem with a thin soil, you naturally have fewer of these mycorrhizae present. 
And so the more fertilizer you apply, it's just going to run off into the water because it's not actually being taken up by the, by the fungus. And so that's really exacerbated in Greece. It's a problem in the US, but really because of Greece's uh, climate, it's exacerbated beyond what it normally would be. And so the question that I set out to uh, address was, can we improve upon this? Can we make a system that is better than the uh, production system that has been used for the past 100 or more years? And so uh, I'll save you a few years worth of late nights in the lab um, and tell you, yes, we can. Uh, and so a few years ago when I was at Yale, I started a company uh, called New Century Biosolutions. Um, so this is a, what we call a green engineering company uh, that's dedicated to uh, solving the environmental problems associated with agriculture. So this is just the picture I like. Um, I'll get more into some of the experiments we did in a little bit. Uh, but what we see here are paper birches. This is a very slow growing tree. <coughs> Excuse me. And on the left, we see a couple of plants that were treated with our biostimulant um, compared to some inorganics like uh, miracle grow. You can imagine these two are miracle grow treated. And then this guy over here is just water. And this is just after a year, and the plants are roughly about twice the size. Um, so this is just a nice picture. Don't really read too much into the data because I'll get into some da <coughs> data in a second. But OK, first question is, what is this biostimulant formula and what is it doing? I, I'm completely comfortable telling you what it is because it's patented. Uh, but we have um, a mixture of amino acids, ascorbic acid, thiamine, and myo-inositol. I'll get into what those are specifically in a bit. Um, but just know that what they're doing is they're contributing to superior growth of plants, as you saw earlier. They contribute to green aesthetics. They are very efficiently used by the plant. They provide organic growth, completely organic, and they are sustainable. Now, the blue boxes indicate, um, so this is just an interesting little tidbit, that uh, for the organic sector, um, it is almost entirely dominated by biomass-derived fertilizers. What does that mean? That means manure. Uh, the, the organic market is almost entirely dominated by manure and compost, which is extremely inefficient and does not provide <coughs> very good growth. So if we get back to that original graph, we've got our, again, our fungus over here and our plant cell over here. And so what does our, for, our formula do? How do we affect this pathway? Really, we just skip this first step. So the amino acid that we're primarily focused on is arginine, which gets directly taken up by the plant. We entirely skip the fungal uh, symbiont. We don't need it. And so Arginine allows for the efficient and direct uptake of essential nutrients. So here's just a graph uh, of some of those same types of trees uh, with one treatment uh, 20 weeks afterwards, just measuring how tall they get. And we see a 16% increase in tree size um, over the inorganic. Over here, this would be, an, again, like a miracle grow. 16% um, increase in size. Now, what are these other groups that seem a little bit closer? Well, we just took pure arginine and pure ammonium nitrate, and we dumped that on some trees, um, which increases their growth a lot, but essentially kills almost all of them because it's just, it's like if you're taking steroids, you're just going to have a lot of problems because the R formula has other things, the other parts of the formula that I'll talk about in a second, uh, that will let them live normal lives and also increases their stress tolerance. And so this is just after 20 weeks, whereas the picture that I showed you was after over a year. Um, so the next test that we did, uh, we were interested in seeing how our formula affected not only tree growth, but affects crop development. Because if we're going to affect agriculture, we need to know how it does with vegetables. So if we're looking at the above ground biomass of radishes, well, first, you might be wondering why we chose radishes. That's just because they grow in a, they, from seeds to a full grown plant in about a month. So it's really easy to work with. So if we're looking at the above ground biomass of radishes, this is just the leafy part that sticks out of the ground we see that there's a 60% increase in the biomass of uh, these radish plants that were treated with our formula versus a miracle grow like product. And if we look at the below ground biomass, which is the important part, we see that there's a 50% increase in biomass. OK, these numbers are wonderful, and I like histograms, but what does that actually look like? Well, so these are just a picture of some radishes that we took. Um, so over here, we've got our miracle grow treated plant. Over here, we've got an organic competitor. Uh, here's just some water, and then these are some radishes that were treated with our guy. Um, and this was after 30 days. 
So if it works with radishes and it works with trees, um, what we're doing now is we're testing out other more valuable crops like corn and bell peppers. Surprisingly, bell peppers are the highest netting product, uh, <coughs> crop product in the US. Did not know that before this. And so this is really interesting because this shows us that arginine is contributing to growth. Whoops. Did not mean to do that. This is really interesting because it shows us that arginine is contributing to the growth of plants. And what are the other components, specifically thymine, ascorbic acid, and myonositol contribute? Well, those guys are specifically vitamin B, vitamin C, and a sugar alcohol that in, that's in that particular order that are all designed to increase the stress tolerance of plants. So if we look here, we see that what we're measuring is the chlorophyll to carotenoid ratio. What is that? So everyone knows that chlorophyll is the pigment that makes plants green. That is the pigment that's involved in photosynthesis. Carotenoids are other pigments that are involved in photosynthesis, but carotenoids are yellow and red. And I think a lot of people know this, that if you see a plant that's supposed to be green and it's yellow or red, that means it's probably not doing too well. And so the higher the ratio of chlorophyll to carotenoids, the healthier the plant is. So this is an indirect way of measuring plant stress. So we want to see more chlorophyll, less carotenoids. And we see that with our treated plants, we get almost 100% chlorophyll composition, so all, very little stress, compared to the inorganic, organic, and H2O, which are you know, significantly reduced. This is about a 6% increase in the chlorophyll to carotenoid ratio at one month. Now, this is at one month. If you let this test drag out for longer, stress is a, has a cumulative effect. You will never recover from a stress event when you're dealing with pigments. They become destroyed and, are in irre they are in re irreplaceable. Excuse me. So as we drag these tests out for longer, we see that that change increases dramatically. I don't have enough data to actually present that, but that's just something that I wanted to put out there. So this is what it looks like. So these are the same radishes, and we're looking at the leaves here. Ignore these at the top. These were just my own notes. So what we have here are the inorganic group, the organic group, water, and then two treated groups of our plant. And you can just take a look at the leaf size. And specifically, when I'm talking about stress tolerance, you want to look at the coloration of the leaf. And so the greener they are, obviously, the more chlorophyll they have. And so ours are obviously bigger and have more chlorophyll. And they just look healthier. So the big question here, when I talked about external costs, I mentioned this process of eutrophication. I showed you the pictures of the algal blooms and the red tides. But none of the data that I've presented so far give an indication as to whether or not our formula reduces the effects of nutrient leaching. So the simplest way to test that is to have a lot of plants grown in a greenhouse, treat them with this fertilizer, and then over a time course, collect the stuff that comes out of the bottom of the pot, and then see how much nutrient is in those, pot, in those samples. What do we see when we, get, when we do that? Oh, sorry. Before I do that, here's just a, an image of the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, and this is actually a heat map of algal growth. Uh, this is as measured by chlorophyll. And so we, if we look at Greece over here, we see that around the coast, we got a lot of yellow and red. The more yellow and red we see, those are the more, that's the higher concentration of algal growth. Those are points at which nutrients are leaching out into the water. And so we see around the coast, especially around developed areas, and we see over here we've got uh, Thraki and Thessaly up here, then our uh, Thessaly is up there, and then um, around those areas, which are some of the largest cultivable areas in Greece, those are the hot spots of eutrophication in the country. This doesn't give us any indication of what's happening in the fresh water that's, going, that, that's taking place on land. This is only looking at the marine ecosystems. So, the question I asked before is, does our formula reduce the harmful leaching effect? The answer is yes. Uh, so if we're looking here, we've got uh, water, our miracle Grow formula, pure ammonium, pure arginine, and then our formula. Uh, compared to the inorganic, a miracle Grow like formula, the, uh, our particular biostimulant reduces nutrient leaching and eutrophication by up to 90%. And compared to pure ammonium, uh, it reduces it by up to 97%. Now, this is done with a small control group, and currently we have a very large group of about 200 plants per treatment group that we're testing, and we expect to get the results back soon. But this is extremely promising preliminary data, 
that suggests that the transition to our formula could essentially eliminate the problem of eutrophication in, <coughs> in farmable areas. So I'd like to wrap up by saying uh, why this innovation might be useful for Greece. So let me just rehash the current state of Greek agriculture. The first is that Greece has uh, little soil with poor nutrients. This contributes to fewer symbionts, these fungal and plant uh, cooperations that we get, that slows growth and promotes fertilizer runoff. The second is that there's relatively little precipitation in Greece. So crops are subjected to drought and heat stress. The third is that uh, Greek agriculture largely consists of fragmented and small farms. And these small farms are, de are dependent on limited crop yield for their annual income. So how can our innovation help? The first is that, as we saw in the previous slide, um, our formula provides re a significantly reduced runoff. And also, we know from the arginine test that there is direct absorption by plants. This eliminates the need for these fungal symbionts and retains nutrients even in poor and thin soils. The second is that we've seen that the plants that we have treated with our formula have improved stress tolerance. So this means that plants can withstand environmental pressures and utilize more energy toward crop production. This is especially effective in areas that are affected by drought and heat stress like Greece. And the third is that our formula provides uh, bigger crops and faster growth. And so small farms that um, depend on small farmable areas for their annual income can maximize crop size and could potentially produce multiple crops in a single growing season. And so with that, I'd like to thank the conference organizers, Constantine and Stella, uh, my Yale mentors, Graham and Ann, uh, my RIN lab here at Harvard, and my department, which is the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology. And so with that, I will take any questions. <laughs> Two questions. Yes. So this is about 30% more expensive than a miracle grow like product, which is largely dependent on the cost of arginine, just because arginine is relatively, um, is, not very, is not produced in great quantities at this point in time, just because there aren't too many uses for it outside of the, the lab. Um, but we expect that as arginine production increases, that the cost will drop significantly. Uh, so arginine is uh, extracted through an HCL-type extraction process where they uh, take just any kind of useless protein um, and just break it down using a digestion. And so I can give you an example of a company that we're kind of working with right now for our own production. They actually take chicken feathers um, from chicken farms that are selling their meat to places like Purdue. And usually they just throw the chicken feathers out. They have absolutely no use for them. Um, and so they take those chicken feathers and they just mix them in with either bacteria or other kind of digestive enzymes and they break them down to get the protein constituents. And then from those you can filter out specific amino acids. Yes. Implement this? Um, so the actual use of this is really easy. It comes as a powder that is soluble, so you just mix it in with water and you can sprinkle it on your plants. Um, it's extremely easy to use. Um, in terms of distribution, that's something that'll come, I think, as we move into the marketing commercialization phase of the company. Right now, we're still in large-scale research operations, um, but that's definitely something that we're keeping an eye out for. And I think that distribution and marketing in each region that we uh, try to move into is going to be different. Um, for the U.S., for example, we're going to be moving primarily through large distributors rather than doing individual sales, but that's definitely something that we're going to be keeping in mind. Yes? Who's funding your work right now? Um, so right now, uh, we've won several grants from Yale University. We also won a large grant from the Environmental Protection Agency, their Small Business uh, Innovative, Innovative Research Fund. Um, so right now, we're working almost exclusively off of grant money. Um, which doesn't have to be repaid and doesn't uh, work through any kind of equity distribution. Um, and we are doing our large-scale research tests out in uh, these agricultural fields right now, and then after we get those results back, we're going to be moving into a VC and investment phase. When do you expect 
uh, probably either fall of this year or spring of next year. We even, we've made some initial contacts, yes. Yes? Um, I'd, I'd love to. Um, I'm, we're open to doing tests in any region that's willing to accept us at this point. Um, the more places that we get to do large-scale tests in, um, we feel that that will do nothing but validate our product because we have the utmost confidence that it will outperform people's expectations. So, um, so our next speaker is Eugene Vios. Um, he's a longtime advocate for social good and the recipient of the American Cancer Society uh, National Relay for Life Rookie Event Award for his longtime contributions to the organization. He previously worked at the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research and at the American Cancer Society Hop Lodge. His work with charitable organizations drives his passion for neuroscience research at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where he has been an undergraduate research fellow at the Siegel Lab since 2010. Um, he's also the, the founder of Simple to Give, a software company developing fundraising solutions for charities and associations that maximize opportunities for real-time social impact. Eugene is a high honors candidate for an AB degree in neurobiology from Harvard College in the May of 2014. He will be continuing his studies um, at the Harvard Medical School in August, where he will be pursuing an MD, MBA degree. Today, he will be sharing his work with Matheno, an educational nonprofit organization designed to support the Khan Academy Greek Initiative for the delivery of free online education to Greek students. So welcome, Eugene. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Stella, for that uh, kind introduction. Can you hear me back there? Okay, we're good. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's been really great listening to the talks today and um, seeing how people are so interested and passionate uh, about Greece and about uh, giving back. Um, today I'm really excited to be sharing with you uh, an initiative that I'm extremely passionate about, uh, which is called Khan Academy Greek. Um, so this is an effort that started about three years ago uh, with the goal of providing Greek students with a world-class education at their fingertips anytime, anywhere, for free. Um, so I'll be touching a little bit on that today. So I'd first like to start discussing education um, in the modern society. So when we think about learning, uh, one of the first things that comes to mind is the conscious, active process uh, that's entailed. And a lot of neurobiologists and PhDs here at Harvard are very interested in that topic. Uh, but along the way, we often uh, lose sight of a lot of the other important driving factors that are involved in the educational experience, the behaviors that are associated with learning. One of those uh, important parts of the learning process is where we choose to get our education. So today, a lot of us can choose from public schools, private schools, charter schools, uh, home schools. There's even online education nowadays. A lot of people here probably went to Greek schools. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity to choose where we get that education from. But of course, uh, that's not universal throughout the United States and elsewhere in the world. It often depends on the geography where you're located. Uh, some places don't have these other types of schools. And it also depends on your financial situation. The reality of the matter is that the ability to choose where we go to school is one of the few ways in which the modern educational model has evolved since the 1800s when the Prussians first uh, designed education as we know it today. And basically their idea is let's take a bunch of students, let's throw them in a small room. Um, not all teachers are as enthusiastic as the professor we had today. Uh, so in many cases, uh, those students are dozing off and it's a very passive experience. And the reality of the matter is that our world has evolved tremendously since the 1800s, but our educational model has not kept up pace. It's a one-size-fits-all model that's not uh, consistent with our 21st century goals. So a major question that we're asking is how can we make ourselves more competitive and how can we do this by rethinking education? So one of the first things we need to do in solving that question is figuring out what it is that's wrong. What's wrong is that the way education works today it's like an assembly line. It's like a factory. So think back to when you were in high school. You had these 45 minute lectures you had uh, six lectures a day. It was a very rigid, uh, strict schedule curriculum. 
uh, and method for evaluation. And the product of this assembly line wasn't necessarily uh, as competent or competitive as initially planned. The other issue is that the way technology is being integrated into education, we are becoming dependent to the extent that if you remove that technology uh, from uh, our educational system, we're unable to perform a lot of the basic tasks um, that we should be able to do. I mean, I can't remember taking a piece of uh, paper and a pencil and solving an equation without a calculator. A great example of how this is also affecting the workplace is if you uh, look at books like Flash Boys. So this just came out. It's about high frequency trading in Wall Street where you have these algorithms that are executing uh, transactions, buying and selling assets on the New York Stock Exchange at about a rate that's a thousand times faster than the rate at which you blink your eye. Um, pretty scary stuff. So what does the 21st century classroom look like? How can we solve this problem? Well, what we believe is that the first step is creating a mastery-based system. And what that means is students should be coming into the classroom knowing what they're going to learn, what the subjects are going to be, and what they're going to be coming out with. What skill sets are they going to develop? Education also has to become personalized. It needs to be engaging. It needs to be interactive. It needs to be interactive because we need to foster curiosity in our students, because that will ultimately lead to a better educational experience. And the way we're going to do that is through maximizing technology in an effective way. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how Khan Academy and Khan Academy Greek are using technology through videos, narrations, and really um, graphic, colorful ways of presenting educational material to stimulate uh, the minds of the future. The beauty about technology is when you're executing it effectively, you can actually measure uh, how well your whole system is operating. So we can see how students are progressing, and teachers can then intervene early before students fall behind. And they can also enable students to move faster through the system if they're advanced. So ultimately, the product is mastery. And by mastery, we mean proficiency in subjects that the students are interested in. When it comes to mastering something, we think of Andre Agassi, uh, who famously said that if you don't practice, you don't deserve to win. And we really do believe that practice is essential. Practice is at the center because through this practice and through the implementation of technology, we can evaluate how students are progressing, and we can also then figure out when to intervene, whether the students are falling behind or whether they're too advanced. So ultimately, how do we create this 21st century classroom, right? How do we implement technology effectively? How do we make teaching interactive, engaging? How do we create um, a mastery-based system? And so Khan Academy is really a step in that direction. It was founded a couple years ago by a gentleman named Saul Khan from over at MIT. Um, you guys have probably heard of the place. Um, and basically his goal was to create an individualized and collaborative educational model with the goal of really providing a world-class education to students for free. They really reversed uh, the classroom model. So I don't know if people here have taken courses at HBS. We have graduate students here, undergrads. Uh, but the way things work there is you have a case model, you read it before class, you go into the classroom and you discuss it. And that's kind of um, the ethos of what Khan Academy is doing. And the idea is that students can achieve proficiency in subjects like math, physics, art history, and computer science. But today is not about Khan Academy itself. It's about Khan Academy in Greek. And this was an effort that was started three years ago by a number of individuals, including myself and my father, as a way to give back to the country in the wake of the economic crisis. And our goal and our belief was that through education, we could really unlock the potential of the country, that we could reinvigorate the future generations. And so the model that we've created here is an individualized collaborative educational program, the ICE program. And what you see here is that we're pairing classroom teaching, so through these videos that are being generated online in math and physics, in parallel, um, we're promoting the adoption of important skills in logic, reasoning, observation, how to represent those observations, and then ultimately collaboration. Because what we believe is that when students become teachers, that's really when they become masters of the material. 
the results are really incredible. So if you look inside the United States, uh, what Khan Academy has achieved, there are about 75 million users of the Khan Academy program with over 6 million logging in every single month. There are 4,600 videos in math and physics uh, and a number of other subjects. You can now prepare for the MCAT uh, on Khan Academy. I wish somebody had told me before I spent all the money at Kaplan. Um, over 240 million uh, videos have since been watched. And the important thing here is that this technology is now being integrated into curriculums um, in the United States. So there are over 30,000 classrooms which are now using uh, the Khan Academy program. And so this is what we've accomplished in Greece by translating these videos, so putting subtitles, by putting voiceovers, by adjusting the content to fit the Greek curriculum. We have over 250 videos translated, over 460 subscribers. Uh, preliminary tests have shown that there's a 57% increase on standardized math exams. If you look inside the United States, that number is well over 100%. Khan Academy has done tremendous, a tremendous number of tests in California, which are really compelling. And this is just with about 30 minutes a day, three hours a week. But the reality is that this doesn't come for free. It actually came with a ton of sweat uh, and a ton of hard work. In fact, this entire team um, is composed that's doing the volunteering, that's creating these videos, is composed of engineers, professors, computer scientists in Greece who are all unemployed. We had a uh, conference a few weeks ago in which the team was talking about the successes that they had, um, but what they don't talk about is the fact that some of these guys haven't had a meal in a couple of days. The way a lot of them make their money is by going playing a buzuki, you know, in a little cafe, but that's not even reliable anyway, because the prices, the wages have been slashed uh, to one-third of what they used to pay. And yet the really compelling thing about this whole story, about Khan Academy Greek, is that these guys have no reason to be doing this, right? This is coming at their expense to spend all this time, but they're doing it because they believe in Greece. And I'm sure if these guys were here, they would be so proud to see all of you and the work you guys are doing to give back to the country. Because the reality is that we really have so much uh, that we owe to Greece. Um, and we are all very confident in its future and are confident that with people like you, uh, we can make it a better place. So in light of really accelerating the efforts of Khan Academy Greek, we created a nonprofit organization called Matheno to raise the funds to bring these guys on board full time and really speed up our efforts. And so for those of you who are interested, uh, you can check us out at uh, matheno.org to learn more about it. You can also help us with the translations at the second link here. For those of you who don't have the means to actually make a contribution, a monetary contribution, uh, you can go to the Simple to Give uh, fundraiser. So this is, as uh, Stella mentioned, this is a fundraising platform that I developed. So you download basically an app. Every time you shop at Amazon and Groupon, up to 20% of what you purchase is donated 100% uh, to the organization. Prices are all the same, so it's free for you. Um, that's it. So uh, we've been trying to go out to radio stations uh, with Sky, um, but it's really in its early stages and we have a lot of work to do. Um, we need a lot of help, yeah. It's mainly been grassroots, so word of mouth. I'm from Sky and yeah. I can help. I have no idea. Like sure. Yeah, it was, uh, I think, a small like radio show or some kind of interview that my father did when he was there a few weeks ago. Um, but Do you have support about being in Greece Khan Academy? Yeah, so my father is the lead advocate for Khan Academy in Greece, so it's a collaboration with them. Um, basically the way Khan Academy works is that they're now trying to disseminate everything abroad, so they have a number of translators with one point person in each country, and so my father's the point person.
Thank you. No, I mean, so some of our uh, volunteers, they're professors, so I mean, they teach and they tutor, and so they've tested it out with their students, but really we're looking to um, make more contacts who can bring this to a much larger scale. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> sure. Right. Sure. It, you know, I, I haven't really had much traction. Papa Andrea was here, and you know, we were talking extensively, uh, and he loved the program and actually wanted to implement it to uh, train government officials in responsibility and help uh, deal with corruption in Greece. Uh, but it really just didn't go anywhere. Uh, I think it's like sure, but he was sure, true, true. But he knows those people, right? He knows those people, though, and you know we didn't really get anywhere. So um, the truth of the matter is that we would love to, you know, talk to them, um, but you know we don't have those contacts. Yeah. Oh. Sure. No, it's to complement. So the beauty about it is that. Teachers aren't kicked out. Um, with this kind of technology, they're, they're central to the whole equation, right? Uh, because the point here is that teachers have a tough time evaluating how students progress, right? It's this one-size-fits-all model. But with this kind of technology where, students can, where teachers can design the problems, they can design you know, the missions and the objectives for the curriculum, they can, put these, they can have these videos online where the students watch them before coming to class, they solve the problems, the teacher can ultimately better evaluate those students, and it can become more of a personal, uh, more engaging experience. That's the goal, so it ultimately complements. Sure. So it's supposed to be at the kindergarten through high school, but I'll be honest, I used it when I was taking organic chemistry because I have some topics there. Um, so I'll be the first to admit that I've used it. Uh, I think they're now starting to branch out. Bank of America partnered also with Khan Academy, and they're doing a lot of uh, financial education as well. So. Sure, yeah. Most of uh, the countries uh, in Europe have an advocate, and those advocates are now translating all of the con Some of the countries have completely translated all 4,600 videos. Um, Very active users? Uh, I don't know the statistics uh, from the other countries. Okay, thank you, Eugene. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thank so, okay, so the conference is coming to an end, and I'd like to say that uh, the ancient Greek philosopher who will be the patron for next year's uh, conference is Pythagoras, Pythagoras. So besides the well-known Pythagorean theorem and the many other things he discovered, Pythagoras has made a cup, uh, the Pythagoras cup, the design of which is instructive for Greece, I think, and for us all. I have uh, the cup here. This is an exact copy uh, of a museum artifact back in Greece. So this is very important. It has a hole at its bottom. When you feel it up to a designated level within the cup, the liquid remains in the cup despite the hole. However, just a drop above this level, and the entire liquid drains out, leaving it empty. Now, Pythagoras conceived it at the time in order to have wine consumed in moderation. However, it is also called the cup of justice, because it reflects one of the, of the basic principles of law, that of hubris and nemesis. So when the, lim the, when the limit is exceeded, hubris, not only what has exceeded the limit is lost, but also everything previously acquired, nemesis. Now, by applying the laws of physics, Pythagoras teaches us, from the depths of time, to accept moderation. The wine we already have, uh, to accept moderation and enjoy the wine we already have in our cup, deriving the maximum benefit from it, you know, pan metron ariston. So together with our warm appreciation for our speakers, we would like to present two gifts, no, we'd like to present a gift to each of the invited speakers. First of all, a plaque to Professor Robinson. And also, we would like to give a copy of the cup to every single one of our invited speakers. So, as well, yeah, every single speaker. You can try it, actually. 
So uh, we would like to thank our speakers today. I think uh, they were very motivational speeches, and uh, hopefully they will have a real impact in Greece in the future. Thank you very much for attending, and uh, we hope to see you all next year. Thank you very much.